and are not being together. Would you bow your head with me in prayer? Our dear Heavenly Father, in Jesus' name, and the merit of his shed blood, we come to thee and ask you to meet with us, speak to us, May your blessed spirit come to the side of each and every one of us. Help us to think. Help us to be enlightened, Holy Spirit of God, that we might know and we might be real men of the faith. The kind that's going to be needed to finish this work. For I pray in Jesus' name, your Father, and amen. <clears throat> in Hebrews 11, we call that the great faith chapter. Now, faith can have many meanings, such as you are of the Christian faith. There, that is a noun, as you well know. But that's not the kind of faith that this particular chapter is talking about. And this is called the Great Faith Chapter, and in it, it has God's Hall of Fame, I believe. Now, faith, my dear friends, is not to reach out and try to embrace something you don't understand. That's not faith. That's magic. Faith is when the Holy Spirit of God gives you some enlightenment as to what he wants you to do and you understand what he wants you to do, then you go ahead and you do what is possible for you to do in prayer. And you'll find if we do the possible, God will come alongside and do the impossible. See, <clears throat> I said to you earlier in the week that miracles are inseparably connected with getting the world evangelized not in getting the United States converted. He didn't tell us to go out and convert the world. He said, you go out and evangelize the world because in the book of Acts it says that now, what he's doing now and has been doing ever since New Testament ever started and was a purpose all along to take out a people from this world for his namesake that's going to spend eternity with him in heaven. And he says that very plainly, two places. They're going to be from every kindred, tribe, and tongue, and nation, and people. And Jesus is not coming back until that's done. He couldn't say it any plainer when he says, And this gospel of the kingdom shall be preached in all the world for a witness unto all nations, and then shall the end come. Now, you're not very bright if you let these radio preachers scare you into sending you all their money because Jesus may come next week. What good's the money to them, too, if he's coming next week? <laughs> you remember this silly, stupid book that was out in 1988, 88 Reasons Why Jesus Will Come? Sold 5,000 copies. I was on my way back from the airport to my office, and I thought I'd just stop in and see a friend of mine named Don Lyons, just have a few minutes of fellowship. His daughter came out to see me and said, Daddy's very busy. He can't see you, but he wants you to read this book and tell him what you think of it. 88 reasons why Jesus will come in 88. In 10 minutes, I gave it back to her. I said, it isn't worth the powder and lead to blow it up. <laughs> You know why he's telling us but all about the gonna come? Nowhere in there could I find anything about getting the world evangelized. Nowhere could I find about completing the blood of the bride of Christ. Peter said, 
2 Peter 3, 12, looking for and hastening his return. Now, friends, you have an agency in bringing back the king. Otherwise, God's dependent upon you, you and you, and other Christian people to bring back the king. He's not going to come down here and do it himself. Now, he's been waiting a long time. Every day that we put it off and we don't get the job done, about 300 souls, 300,000 souls go into a crisis eternity. Is it nothing to you? Now it's going to take real, living, vibrant faith for you to ever do anything about this great job that God's given to you. And many a time I've sat down and almost cried to think that God would ever use me to work for him. I have gone to Detroit many times and lectured for General Motors, for Ford, for Chrysler. And that was pretty heady stuff. But one night I'm sitting in O'Hare and I got to fly over the ocean that night to London. I'd only been there 21 times, so I wasn't exactly jumping for joy to fly over there at night. And I'm dead tired. But I wasn't doing it for any company. I was doing it for the Lord. And I sat there and I thought how tired I was. But then I thought how great. God is, and what a little speck of sand I was in comparison. And to think that I could work for him, and he was interested in me and what I would do, and he needed my hands and my brains and whatever I had. I'll tell you, I got up and I marched on that plane. You'd have thought I was the captain of a Cox's army. You don't even know what that is. <laughs> I marched down there with real military bearing. Got on there, Frasier said Daisy. See, to work for the king of kings and lord of lords. I've been around a lot of men and big business, very proud of who they work for. Well, I like to tell them, I work for the king of kings and the lord of lords, and I see you beat that. <laughs> well, we ought to take it serious, shouldn't we? Now, in this chapter, the great faith chapter, I want you to notice that God by his spirit, would give men some enlightenment as what he wanted them to do. And then when they got busy and started doing it, it was faith. Up until they got to moving and doing what was possible for them to do, which God expected them to do, it was only mental ascent. But when they got to moving and going, then it became faith. By faith, Moses, when he came to years, refused to be called the sons of Pharaoh's daughter choosing rather to suffer affliction for, with the people of God than to enjoy the pleasures of sin for a season. Through faith, he kept the Passover. Through faith, and you go on to see, and you keep down there, listen to this, by faith they passed through the Red Sea as by the dry land, which the Egyptians as saying to do were drowned. By faith, the walls of Jericho fell down. I used to preach on the walls of Jericho and show how God did that. You know, they walked around that place once a day for six years, for six weeks, six days. I'll get it right yet. <laughs> then on the seventh day, they walked around it again, and they walked it, and they be, God told them to blow their trumpets. Then I believe God came down from heaven with his divine amplifier. You know what an amplifier? That takes some little noise and makes it into something. There's a building there starting to tear down in Chicago called Chicago Stadium. They had an organ in there that they would not let any neophyte, any youngster, any person that didn't know a lot about organs to ever touch it. You know why? If you'd ever pulled out certain stops on that, pull them all the way out, you'd have shook the building down shook the building down. You can do terrible things with noise. With noise. I worked in research on some things that we could do with noise. I believe it's possible when you got men coming here with a bunch of LCLs and got about 100 in each one of them, we could turn these things on and those guys wouldn't even know their name. They'd get, be jumping out the rear end of the boat instead of the front. Jumping over the side. Because of what we, how we could get them confused with noise, if you understand how to work and manipulate with noise. 
So all they had to do was do what God had told them to do, blow the trumpets, and he comes down with his divine amplifier, and he shakes the walls down. You know something? We know that the walls fell in, not out. Uh, that takes something, doesn't it? To fall in. A lot of them fall out by themselves, but to fall in. Now, this whole chapter is God giving people some enlightenment as to what he wanted them to do. Then when they went ahead and they did the possible, God came right alongside and did the impossible. Now, dear friends, in the New Testament, every miracle that Jesus performed, he was teaching something. Now, if you never spend any time to understand what the, some of the miracles mean, you don't know a thing about the miracles. All you know is that they're in the Bible. Now, in Jesus' day, you know, they didn't do it like we do. The writers that seem to write on the miracles spend most of their time defending them. They never argue about that. Never need to defend them because many of those people saw them. So, there was controversy over the miracles, but the first one was under whose authority were they performed? And it, there was no gray area, either under Beelzebub or under the power of God himself. Now, I think all of us in this room have made up our mind. Here. Ah, but then, now comes the problem. What was the significance of the miracle of that day? And everyone had significance then, and they have significance for you and me today. I'll just give you one. you find in Matthew. I think it's Matthew 18. Peter and Jesus didn't have money to pay their taxes. I've been that way. I even sold a, a 1910, had my mother sell it and keep part of it so I could pay my taxes. I got $250 for it, and the guy that got it from me sold it for $6,000. So you see how bright I am. But he had to keep about 20 years, too. Peter and Jesus didn't have money to pay their taxes. So he says, now, Peter, cast your hook out here. And the first fish, the first fish, boy, notice how he called this. Not say, well, you're going to catch a fish after a while, which will have a coin in its mouth. No. The miracle was the first fish. You can go over there today and catch fish just like that. Throw something over his board that's silver and shining, and that kind of a fish is spelled M-U-S-H-T. I don't know how to pronounce it. You have to figure that out. But you're over there yet, and you throw something over a, a spinner or a, that's shiny through there, and they hit it so quick. And he said, cast your hook over there. Up came a fish, and he said, there's going to be a coin in his mouth. Going to be a coin in his mouth. And sure enough, he took it out, there was a coin in his mouth. Now he said, Peter, you go and pay our taxes for me and for thee. First he's teaching, Peter, we Christians are going to be good civil people. We're going we're to pay our taxes so we can have roads and schools and policemen and, and judges and things like that. First thing that should teach us, that we're going to be good civil citizens. How about that, Rocco? That's what God wants. Second, it shows you and me that there are certain things that God in his sovereignty has decided that he needs done, but he's limited himself to the help of mankind. He's not going to do it. He's not going to do it, but he'll enable you and me to do it. Now, if you don't care what God's program is, that won't mean a thing to you. But if you're in love with Jesus Christ, who came down here to give a gospel that we could take to the world, and he died to give it to us, you should want every mother's son that's alive on the face of this earth tonight and today to hear it. Isn't that right? 
Well, now, I'm going to show you how people are that are his people. You see, he said, you follow me, gentlemen. I'll make you fishers of men. He went down to them one time. They're fishing. They're not doing it very well. He showed them, well, I can fill a boat. In fact, it began to sink. Boy, they can see all that money flopping overside, see. <laughs> no, he said, you follow me. These fish, when you get them in the shore, they're going to die. You're going to kill them. But I'm going to send you forth as fishers of men, and you make dead men live. Is that right? They're dead in their trespasses of sin. They're separated from God. They're loose from God. They have no communication with him, and he is far, far away from them because they're living for themselves in sin. Ah, but if you follow me, I'll make you fishers of men, and you'll make dead men live. By dead, we mean separated from God, loose from God. And men to live, live in a right relationship with Jesus that he comes to take up his abode within our bosom, our breast, our life, our intimate presence, and to live out his life again for you and do what he did. And he said, as my father has sent me, so send I who? You. Yes. So if you get filled with the Holy Ghost, friends, I'm going to tell you right now, you're going to get filled with the Holy Ghost. A lot of people, God's never guided you, but you're like a boat tied up to a dock. Even God couldn't guide that boat. Isn't that right? You can't guide a boat that's tied up to the dock. Well, I will also hasten to say many of you are not ready to go yet. And I, I think you would know who you are out there. I'm not pointing anyone out. I have no particular person in mind. But now... We want to see how God did it with the people in the Old Testament. Now, I'm going to tell you we can do it today, but wait a minute. I want to finish a little bit about this Jesus and the coin and to make fishers of men out of them, and to make dead men live. But have you ever gone to churches where all they talked about was money, 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 money? Why? They, they can't have any service without taking up a collection. I've been in them. I even been taught by some. You should never have any Christian service without taking up collection. It reminds me they had a bad wreck. Eight cars, fifteen people laying along the road moaning, and one guy said, "Somebody do something Christian." So a guy got up and took up a collection. <laughs> <laughs> Probably went promptly over the hills. <laughs> Oh, uh, no, no, no. That's one of the things that impresses me. Everybody comes in here. You don't take up a collection and say, oh, boy, I wonder how much they got. What can we get out of him? That's one of the things I like about this place. You're, you're more concerned, what can we do for the people that come here rather than what can we get out of them? That's Christian. The other way, wanting to milk them as they come in. Oh, my, that's so far from true Christianity. It shouldn't even need anyone to mention that. Now, what says? He says, the coin will have fish in its mouth. Now, let me tell you something. If you show me a church that's having financial trouble, I'll show you a church that's not following Jesus. Because if they're following Jesus, they're going to be catching men. And the coin is going to be in the fish's mouth. <laughs> you see that? When men fall in love with Jesus, man, they give everything they got. I had a man I worked with. He was chairman of the board. I was president. He was tighter than a paper around a firecracker. Now, if you don't <laughs> Man, I hate to go to lunch with that guy. Oh, it was terrible. And I didn't mind working with him, but when I got away from there, I put a lot of real estate between because, man, was he tight. <laughs> he reminded me of some of my Scottish friends that won't wear rubber soled <coughs> shoes because they give. <laughs> <laughs> well, he got saved. My, oh, my, what a difference in a man. 
I had to call him in my office. Now, mind you, he's my he, boss. He represented the Whitney family. And their investment. I said, now look, Robert, I'm just so pleased you got right with the Lord Jesus. I prayed for you for years. And you know I did all kinds of things for you. He said, yeah, I used to wonder what was wrong with you. <laughs> you did so much for me and you never wanted any money for it. Well, I wanted to show you I loved you and that God loved you and Christ loved you. If I'm there to get everything out of you, that's not love. And he says, you had me really going. So I got down alongside the bed, he says, and I, up in Detroit in a hotel up there, and I really got right with the Lord, and Jesus saved me. So about two months later, we had another talk. I said, Robert, I appreciate you giving money away, but we got to have money around here enough to run the railroad. <laughs> he was giving it all away. See what I mean? See, when a man gets right with God, you don't have to beg him to give his money. You've got to hold him down. You don't have to dangle him over hell every Sunday morning to get him to do something. You've got to regulate him so he doesn't preach himself to death. And he gets some sleep, and he watches over his family, and he's a good family man, not out preaching every night because he needs some time with his family. The person's right with God. The preacher, all he's got to do is regulate him, hold him down. But the deadheads, you've got to get the soap poker after them. Well, whenever a man's got to do that and dangle you over hell every Sunday morning, there's either something wrong with you or him. Sometimes it's not too far hard to figure that out. Now, they all died in the faith. These are people that God's Spirit had taught them what he wanted them to do. When they saw it, they got busy and started doing what was impossible to them. But God's Holy Spirit and his angel come alongside and help them do the impossible. Let me say it to you again. The miraculous and the impossible are no problem to God. God's problem with us is to get us to do the possible. And he'll come alongside and do the impossible. Now he had that problem in the Old Testament. Before we could ever have a gospel to be taken to the ends of the world, he had to come up with a nation. He started all over with a guy named Abraham, didn't he? Abraham. And from this, in 400 years, they had a nation. But now he had to get them back into the promised land and get them into a place which he's going to clean it all out and make it so it's habitable for Christian people. And let me tell you, that promised land, before they went in there, that was the biggest moral mess you can ever hear about. Terrible. And so, he intended for Moses to go in, but Moses blew his top at God, didn't he? Moses never made it. But Caleb and Joshua did. And if this place is so full of everything that's wrong in this world, you're going to put your kids in there, what would you do with it if you owned it? You'd clean it up, wouldn't you? All right, now you got a place that's decent to, to raise his family and to bring forth the Messiah. But boy, as I read the Old Testament, I've often thought this, friends. God could have destroyed the Israelites a hundred times and been just and holy in doing it. But he's rich in mercy. He's rich in mercy, friends. He's gracious. So now, this little lesson I am going to give you here today has to do with him getting them into the promised land and even having a nation to put in there. And it starts with a man named Elisha. And he was really something, this fellow. Now, if you will, please, you're going to read about a very simple miracle. It wouldn't be simple to you and to me, but it was to this man because he was a prophet of God. Now, reading to you from Second Kings, Sixth chapter, the first verse. We're going to take off from there. And the sons of the prophets said unto Elisha, Behold now, the place where we dwell with thee is too straight for us. Second Kings 6, 1 and 2. It's about two acres this side of the book of Psalms. Psalms. <laughs> 
and Samuel's on one side and Chronicles on the other. Let us go, we pray thee, unto Jordan. Take thence every man a beam. Let us make us a place there where we may dwell. And he answered, Go ye. Jews are just wandering around. One said, By, Be content, I pray thee, and go with thy servants. And he answered, I will go. This is Elisha will go. And he went with them, and they came to Jordan, this little river, which is when I cross it, about as wide as from that wall to this wall, maybe five feet deep. But as one was felling a beam, the axe head fell into the water. And he cried and said, Alas, master, for it was borrowed. That didn't seem to bother him as much as if he didn't have it. Maybe he didn't like all that work that had to go on the other end of that axe handle. And the man of God says, Where fell it? And he showed him the place. And he cut down a stick and cast it in hither. Mind you, now mind you, he's not even got control of that stick. Cast it in thither, and the iron did swim. Oh, baby, is that some problem? The axe head swum. I don't think a wiggle did it. <laughs> and now it's on the end of the axe handle. It's on the ax end of the axe handle. Now, to me, that's a very simple miracle. Not that I would know how to do it. But they needed some places to live and to worship, and it's going to take work, and they don't have hardly any tools made out of metal. And here they got an axe, and the thing comes off the handle and down in the water. Well, that's a serious problem to them. And so they've got a real prophet of God there, Elisha. What a man. <laughs> and all he did, he whittled him out a stick, <laughs> and he throws it in there and goes around pretty soon. Here it comes up. Got that thing on the end of it. Now, my Bible says, them that know their God shall be strong and do exploits. I believe in time to come. There's many men, many women in this room before you go to meet your maker. I don't think most of you will be alive to meet him in the air, that's for sure. God is going to do mighty things for you to show them there is a God and he's alive today. And he can make that one look like peanuts. Now, if you would read this rest of this chapter, the sixth chapter, you would see that they were in a terrible mess. They were in a terrible mess. And they are now up there in Samaria, a place that the Jews were even ashamed to be, but it was better than being there and having nothing to eat and nobody protect them and anything. So, in this, he tells them what to do. And he tells them, in here, listen to this. Came to pass that after this that Ben-Hadad, king of Syria, gathered all these hosts and went up and besieged Samaria. That's where they were. Now they're in the city. And there was a great famine in Samaria. And behold, they besieged it until an ass's head was sold for fourscore pieces of silver and a fourth part of a cab of dove dung for five pieces of silver. Now that's hard up for food. Otherwise, they're surrounded. They can't get food in there. It isn't big enough to grow their own food and raise animal seed. And here's the story then. But they begin to eat each other. Cannibals. I'll read that. As the king of Israel was passing by upon the wall, there cried a woman unto him, saying, Help, my lord, O king. And he said, If the Lord do not help thee, when shall I help thee? Out of the barn floor, out of the wine press? And the king said unto him, What aileth thee? And she answered, The woman said unto me, Give thy son that we may eat him today, and we will eat thy son tomorrow. So we boiled my son, did eat him, and I gave unto her on the next day, Give thy son that we may eat him. And she hath hid his, her son. And it came to pass, when the king heard the words of the woman, he rent his clothes, 
he passed by upon the wall, and the people looked, and behold, he had slack cloth within and on his flesh. And he said, God do so more also to me, if the head of Elisha, the son of Shaphat, shall stand on him this day. But Elisha sat in his house, and the elders sat with him, and the king set a man before him. But ere the messenger came to him, he said to the elders, See how this son of a murderer hath sent to take away mine head? Look, when the messenger cometh, shut the door, and hold him fast at the door. Is not the sound of his master's feet behind him yet? And while he yet talked with them, behold, the messenger came down unto him, and he said, Behold, this evil is of the Lord. What sh should I wait for the Lord any longer? Question. Then Elisha. See this chapter 7. That's just man's idea of, of how to do it. But we're on the same story. Then Elisha said in the first verse of Second Kings 7. Now this next half a page is going to be Next, this particular page, the rest of it, is going to be very important to you in your life. Listen very closely. Then Elisha said, Hear ye the word of the Lord. Thus saith the Lord, Tomorrow about this time shall a measure of fine flour be sold for a shekel and two measures of barley for a shekel in the gate of Samaria. Otherwise, he's saying, You're going to have a lot of food this time tomorrow, and it's going to be very cheap. Boy, how's that for us? prophet. This man has heard from the Lord because he'd been walking with the Lord. He'd been obeying the Lord, doing what God had told him to do. Then the Lord on whose hand the king leaned answered the man of God and said, Behold, if the Lord would make windows in heaven, might this thing be? And he said, Behold, thou shalt see it with thine eyes, but shalt not eat it. When you read the last verse of this particular chapter, you're going to see every bit of this came true. Now, let me read. And there were four leprous men at the entering of the gate. And they said one to another, Why sit here till we die? Why sit here until we die? Now, do you know what leprosy is a symbol of? The type of, in the Old Testament, and then a sin. Sin. But these are four leprous men. Doesn't mean they got this by sinning. No, it doesn't mean that at all. But he but they had leprosy. Now this is just God's way. You know, when God got ready to take care of that fella Goliath, he didn't go to the seminaries. He didn't go to the school of the prophets. He sent Daniel down to see a man named Jesse. He said, Jesse, I hear you got seven sons. God's writing off Saul because he's rejected the way of the Lord. And the next king's going to be one of your sons. Let me see your sons. So Jesse paraded seven Hebrew young men passing. He got no witness spirit. Finally, he says, Jesse, don't you have another son somewhere? Yes. Where? Oh, out there in the lowest down job, we got ten and sheep because his brothers don't like him because he was an illegitimately conceived young man. I didn't say he was an illegitimate. There's probably a lot of people in this world that were in this room that were illegitimately conceived, but their man and their daddy was man enough to marry their mother. So they were not born illegitimate. They may have been illegitimately conceived, and that's what David was. Any man who really knows the Old Testament the way he should. Because this is what he's saying when in Psalm 51, 5, you people try to make it to prove, not all of you, of course, try to make it prove original sin. That's so far from the truth. Because this man, David, he had two sisters. Jesse was not their father. He had seven brothers. That his mother was not their mother. Jesse and David's mother had an illicit sexual experience. She got pregnant. 
she told him and that she was pregnant and going to have a child, well, he was man enough to live with his own mistake and admit it, confess it. And he brought Jesse and his mother and two sisters to live with him where they lived. And they were not poor people. But his brothers, they were ashamed of Jesse because he's what you would call a blot on the family escutcheon. The coat of arm. So, they give him the lowest down job and they treat him terrible. Well, Joseph, my, a good bit the same way, but Joseph, as a youngster, was not like David. David was a sweet psalm singer of Israel. He's, a, he's treated like he's a poor relation. He's not a part of the family. His brothers treated him absolutely terrible. Now, Joseph's brothers treated him terrible, too, but he was a real snot nose, Joseph was. <laughs> <laughs> you go back and read it, because his daddy spoiled him. Give him that coat of many colors, probably the other guys were wearing gunny sacks. I don't know, but... <laughs> <laughs> well, the old man spoiled him. And, oh, he thought he was something. Well, they will show you what we do with something. They sold him into <laughs> slavery, didn't they? <laughs> they got rid of him, told the old man and wild animals to eat him. But this guy, Daniel, or David, oh, no. He hadn't been a part of no monkey shines. He's out there. He's called the sweet psalm singer of Israel. And he brought joy to the heart of God. Because here come a bear one day. He wants some lambs, too. He's got all these sheep. Now, if that had been you and me, we have said, now, Lord, he who runs today lives to ten sheep another day. But not David. David wasn't tending sheep. For his daddy, he was tending sheep as unto the Lord Jesus. Unto the Lord Jesus. And he went for that bear, and he and the Holy Ghost killed that bear with that 16-year-old boy's hands. How's that doing the possible and God coming alongside and doing the impossible? Get what I'm saying? God will never tell you to do anything. If you do your part, well, hey, he'll come alongside and he'll do the impossible. Boy, what a great thing to learn about our great God, isn't it? Oh, sometime later, now here comes a bear. Well, he wants some lamb stew, too, and he wants it free. He must have been a Democrat. <laughs> I used to be a Democrat until I learned how to read. <laughs> Because I worked too hard. By the time I got 21, boy, I'd done it. I was a man, but then I was broken for the harness. And I thank God I had a dad that did break me for the harness to work and to think. Because this is a blessing in disguise. Don't ever think of work as a result of the curse or the result of the fall of man. No, Adam and Eve had jobs. Their jobs was to tend the garden, wasn't it? Or do you think I'm quoting Shakespeare? <laughs> Now, here's a 16-year-old here's a lad that's killed a bear and he's killed a lion. By the way, I'll tell you what that lion died of. Oh, David went up to him and, oh, you think you're tough? And he started pulling out his beard. <laughs> I'm afraid of you. I pulled that one out. Oh, he died of a stroke. <laughs> that skinny 16-year-old kid is driving me nuts. And he isn't even afraid of me. Why would he? The, he and the Holy Ghost? How could you scare he and the Holy Ghost? Now, tell me. But he took that bear and killed him with his own bare hand. I don't think he did any more than pull his whiskers. He died of a stroke. I, of course, I'm going beyond what is written there. <laughs> <coughs> so they bring him in. They show him to the prophet, Samuel. Samuel looks at him, oh boy, now he's on the right wavelength. Boy, the Spirit of God says, that's him. Now my point I want to give to you, and this should give all of us aid and comfort. When God gets ready to do things, he doesn't use the, the proud, the rich, and the best educated in the world. No, no, no. First, he giveth grace to the lowly. He resisteth the proud, but he giveth grace to the lowly. And then he uses the weak things to confound the mighty. When you think you're mighty, then you're really weak. 
and God can't use you. So if you're weak and you don't know everything you th think you ought to know, oh boy, you're, you're getting in that great position where God can use you. But when you think you know everything, you're, you've got a front seat in the shelf already, but you don't know it. And you got a hat up here that says Ichabod Hunt. God uses the weak things in this world to confound the mighty. But they're weak things that know what they're doing. They know what they're doing. All right, now here's a guy, here's a guy named Elisha. He knows what he's doing. But also, dear friends, watch what these four lepers, these four sinners. I think they're four sinners that have been converted. Now, read with me, if you will, please. Start the third verse. And there were four leprous men entering in at the gate. And they said one to another, why sit we here until we die? I ask you people that. Why sit here in the United States until we die when we've got a world out there that needs evangelizing? If you want to know what's wrong with the churches in the United States, if they ever had anything, now they got spiritual indigestion. You just sit and eat and eat and eat and never move and never do anything, you're going to get that big and it'd take a derrick to move you. You certainly wouldn't be very mobile and very useful. We need to get out and work off this spiritual fact and spiritual enlightenment that we've been given to show this world how our great God is. Sure, they're going to call us fanatics, call us nuts. I've been called that, but I tell them at least I'm screwed to the right bolt. What are you screwed to? <laughs> you see, a fanatic is a person that's very enthusiastic about something you have no interest in. The guys that have touched my life for something that means something have been fanatics in the world's sight and in the sight of the academics. If we say we will enter in the city, that is, we keep on sitting here. But if we say we will enter in the city, then the famine is in the city and we shall die there. See, these guys are not inside the wall. They're hanging around the outside because there's nothing in there to eat. And we shall die there. And if we sit here, we shall die also. Now therefore, come and let us fall into the host of the Syrians, and if they save us alive, we shall live, and if they kill us, we shall but die. That, that sounds to me like Esther. She told her wonderful uncle, Mordecai, you take the people, you get the people to fast and pray three days and three nights, and I'll get my maidens to do the same. And then I'll go in. I'll go in to see the king. It has ears. I'll go in, and if I die, I die. Now, friends, my question to you is right here. You're going to die, but what are you going to die for? Your selfishness? Or are you going to die for the glory of God and to get the world evangelized? That God might be worshipped by every kindred, tribe, and tongue, and nation of people. You're going to die. You, you get to choose what you die for. That's a great thing. You can make a lot of money, and you can die with your money. But you can make a lot of money, and you're going to use it for the glory of God and to get his world evangelized. I know I did that over in a place called Chateau Day in Switzerland. When Miami just started the first school, they forgot soon why we started this school. Later, the schools were to make money so that the leaders could maintain their lifestyle. As said to me very smartly by Chris. She's the one that put it into words, and she was exactly right. She never spent 1% of the time around them that I did. But that wasn't so. Now, at this time, I'm talking, boy, I would teach, Francis Schaeffer would teach, we was really pounding something in their head. Later, we'd bring Gordon Olson. Oh, man, they're getting hit now. I remember out on the porch where we ate lunch, and this very attractive woman from California came up. She said, Mr. Khan, did I understand you this morning? That's how much she knew about Christianity. Did you say there's going to be no gender in heaven? No female, male? I said, yes, you did. 
You also said no sex? Right. She said, then I don't want to go there. Boy, we sure knew what she lived for, didn't we? There won't be any sex in heaven. What is he going to need it for? Need it for? Well, here's, here's two men. They're going to die. Now they're sitting down. They're doing some serious thinking for the first time in their life. And that's what every son of a living God ought to be doing in this day. What am I going to die for? For my own family, my own selfishness? But die for the glory of God. That all the world might know there's a God in Israel. That fellow, David, when he ran toward Goliath, I said, ran. First he stopped at the brook. Spent a little time there. He found five round stones. Now you thought, wow, he's piddling around. No, he wasn't. You know what I found? Five round stones, I'll tell you. Goliath had four big brothers. <laughs> and he was going to take care of each one of them if they wanted more of that. And now he didn't pick out six or eight. He didn't want never figure on missing. You know why? Because his job is to go for it and to fling it. He could have stumbled and thrown it that way and Goliath been that way and still hit him right there. <laughs> At about 208 miles an hour, and went right through and took his little brain with him. Why? It was all in why he did it. Why? The why. And the why was, as he ran, he said, that all the world might know there's a God in Israel. How's that from motive, Brother Ed? Pure as the driven snow. Not so people think he's a great saint or he's this, but all the world might know there's a God in Israel. Because a few, the day before, he asked this great question. Because here's the army of the Lord standing there like a bunch of girl scouts. Not even boy scouts. And out comes Goliath. And he starts calling him all kinds of names. Dirty names. And... I'll take your best. If he kills me, we'll serve you. Well, he didn't mean it at all, but he's saying it. Because the next day it's going to prove it. But if I kill you, your man, you're going to serve us. And then he starts calling them all kinds of names. Here's one of the three great classic questions in the whole Old Testament. I'll give you the other two if you want them. Who is this uncircumcised Philistine that he should defy the armies of the living God? I'll take care of him with the help of the Holy Ghost. What a great question. Right? Who is this circum uncircumcised Philistine? He can talk like that? Don't you people know there's a God and he's here? He hears it, and you're over there quaking like you're a bunch of timpani players with the cymbals between your knees. <laughs> well, there was another great question when this guy, Gideon, only guy in the whole lazy nation working. The rest of them are starving to death. He's going to starve to death with a sigh in his hand. He's out there cutting wheat. The only one in the whole nation. Along comes the name of the Lord, and he says, Gideon, thou mighty man of valor. I can just see Gideon looking around. Who's he talking to? He ain't talking to me. <laughs> <laughs> me, a mighty man of valor? I'm the least of seven kids. What's wrong with you, man? Well, he's working. He's working. That other bunch have all joined the WPA. <laughs> My wife's got a good name for that. I'll let you, let her tell you. One time out in Arizona, WPA was working, and here's a guy leaning on his shovel, you know, way over like this on a rattlesnake. He said, get out of here. If I had another shovel, I'd kill you. <laughs> <laughs> Who is this uncircumcised Philistine? The mighty man of valor. Now here's a great question that Gideon asked. Then, if I be a mighty man of valor, then where be all the miracles that our forefathers told us of on the other side? 
of the Red Sea and Jordan. Where, where, where be the miracle? Now, let me ask you a question, dear friend. I ask you personally. Where be all the miracles in your life if you're walking with the Lord? They ought to be there. Ever since I've been married to that dear blonde sitting back there, I knew I needed miracles, and I needed them every day, and I got them every day. Because I'd gone out on a limb so far for the gospel's sake and for poor people's sake and for missionaries' sake that I needed them, and I expected it, and I lived as best I could to get them. And God is no man's debtor. Is that right? I saw them day after day after day, and I expected them day after day. I was telling someone here this morning, there was a time when I woke up, I got down on my knees, prayed for my missionary friends around the world in my little room. You should have seen my room, but oh, was that palatial. It was the penthouse. I don't only mean it on the top floor. It was so small, I had to back out in the hall to change my mind, <laughs> let alone my clothes. Small, even the mice were hunched back. <laughs> I wasn't living it up. No, I was living very, very frugally. And one day, they t bring me into board meeting. The only time I was ever brought in a board meeting. You probably think I'm nuts when I tell you this, and I never said it out loud in my life before. I was preaching every week. During the week, if I wasn't lecturing somewhere, I lived right down in the poorest, raunchiest part of the town because I'm preaching rescue mission. Nobody else would ask me. So I'm preaching a street meeting and a rescue mission. They called me in this beautiful place. said, Harry, we sure like what you've done here. Man, what you've done for our engineering department. What you've done for our marketing department. What you've done to help the research department. Harry, we've decided that we're going to get you an apartment, pay for it ourselves, down to Lakeshore Athletic Club, right on Lake Michigan. Isn't that pretty nice? I said, yes, it's pretty nice, gentlemen. I appreciate it. But I respectfully decline. I respectfully decline, decline because I'm trying to win the port of Christ. And the poor drunks on Skid Row, and I was one in some of them, not many, but I was one in them. But I had to live down there, know their language, and know their problem. And I worked right down there with them. And I said, I respectfully decline. Five years before that, I gave my right arm to live in the Lakeshore Athletic Club. What a beautiful place. But I never, never, never took the day. And you know something? If I had to do over again, I'd do it again. I'd do it again. Sure, I didn't meet all the big shots over there. I met a lot of big shots on the way down. <laughs> Boy, I don't think I didn't. Man, I met movie stars, first, second, or third husbands down there. When their movie star wife would throw them overboard, they'd become drunks, and they wind up on Skid Row. I preached a lot of so-called great people. I didn't know it at the time, but I did. But they're on their way down. And then you could talk to them. You, most of you wouldn't remember a beautiful blonde named Madeline Carroll. Oh, man, I had her husband come to the altar one night. What a mess he was. But I could give him hope in Christ. Couldn't give him any hope in Hollywood because they didn't have any hope out there either. Now, that's the way Satan has it getting at us sometimes. Offers things that we don't really need for what he's got us doing. See what I'm saying? The way devil ruins most people is give them good jobs and a lot of money. Then they'll destroy themselves. You see, one built-in weakness we have in Christianity. You get to be an honest man and you work hard and you use your head. And you be a good employee, boy, you're going to prosper. And you begin to make some real money. But ah, look out. That blessing will become a curse. That blessing will become a curse if you don't handle it the right way and the way God would have you handle it. And I've seen it so many times, I can't even remember all the names. Yes, and I've known men, my wives, as poor as church mice with one or two little kitties. 
go to church and get saved. Then the little kiddies come each Sunday night with them and sleep on that hard <laughs> pew. I've seen it many, many times. That daddy of theirs would now become an honest man and work hard. And the companies appreciated men that are loyal and work hard and appreciate a job, get their own time, not be belly acres or want to get a union in the place. And they begin to prosper. And they begin to prosper. And then pretty soon you don't see the man and wife at prayer meeting on Wednesday night. You've probably seen Ed yourself many times. Oh, and then pretty soon he goes on up. And now he becomes executive. And now he buys a summer home on the lake. Next year he buys a big boat on the summer home. And on Decoration Day or Memorial Day, he says, bye-bye, Jesus. We'll see you after Labor Day. And you try, men, you try telling that to your wife, let alone to God's Holy Spirit. It's a rare man that prosperity doesn't ruin him, especially Christian men. So these men, they decide they're going to die. All right, now let's watch this. And they rose up in the twilight to go into the camp of the Syrians. When they were come to the uttermost part of the camp of Syria, behold, there was no man there. And the Lord had made the host of the Syrians to hear a noise of chariots and a noise of horses and the noise of a great host of heaven. And they said one to another, Lo, the king of Israel hath hired against us the king of the Hittites and the king of the Egyptians to, to come upon us, whereupon they arose and fled in the twilight and left their tents and their horses and their asses, even the camp as it was, and fled for their life. See, here's God doing a job. Four lepers. Now, you may have had a terrible, raunchy record before you came to Christ. We're just like these lepers. None of us were prizes. But when God gets some men and decides they're going to die for what's right, watch what he does. Now, and when these lepers came to the othermost part of the camp, they went into one tent and did eat and drink carried then silver and gold and raiment, and went and hid it. Oh, what does that sound like? And came again and entered into another tent and carried thence also and went and hid it. Then said one to another, We do not well. This day is a day of good tidings. We hold our peace. And if we tarry till the morning light, some mischief will come upon us. Now therefore come that we may go and tell the king's household. Say, the church in Jesus Christ is not doing well. With everybody wanting a three, four hundred thousand dollar house and a three car garage with three hundred thousand souls going into hell every day. Yes, they're in church on Sunday morning. That is, their body is. Their mind's out in the golf course on the lake or doing some other selfish thing. Yes, we do not well here in the United States, the Church of Jesus Christ, where the United States citizens spend more money on dog food in a year than we give to foreign missions. Now, if you're proud you're a Christian, that should cut you down to size. I know one year I was working to get 6,500 Bible school and seminary graduates the money to get out to mission field. And I didn't even make it for 50. Then they treated me like I was... I'd have gone off my nut. My dear wife and I set up. We had 100 missionaries starving, literally, because you couldn't get money out of Great Britain at the time. No, sterling went sky high. Wouldn't let it out of the country. No money leaving. So Evangelized Fields Mission had 100 of them out there starving. And a crippled chemist who had gone out from the Welsh Revival, 1908, to, to India, crippled. He went out there and went way up there, walked there. And he started a little mission. It all started from the Gospel of John. Today, that one thing is over there. It's really shaking that part of the world. 
because he was crippled. And I knew him. And I gave money to another mission he was interested in. My wife and I did. He calls me one day and he said, Brother Khan, I've got something so important to say to you. I don't want to say it over the phone. I want to come down there, maybe go sit in a park bench and talk about it. Now, mind you, this man was educated as a chemist. Been a missionary. Now he, he could hardly get around. There certainly was no place in India to be for him. So he started this little chemical company up in Toronto. By the way, dear ladies, have you ever heard the song, Wounded for Me? His wife wrote that song. Wounded for me, wounded for me. A missionary song. He came down, got a, got a cab out where we lived. We walked over to Garfield Park, which wasn't any further than from here to here, precious graveyard out here, cemetery. Sat down, he began to cry. Here's a man, seven years of age, crying. He starts giving me the names of all these people that they had around the world, and he wasn't even on that mission board. He said, Brother Harry, here's one. I got a letter she's eating. She's a doctor, and she has to eat fishworm. Fishworm. Would you help me? Would you help me to raise the money? So I had a city-wide crusade this weekend out in Coffeyville, Kansas, a little town of about 30, 40,000. So my wife and I, we set up and got these kind of pieces of cardboard that when you went to grade school, you made, you made uh, art exhibits on them, you know? And I got their missionary names, got letters from them, I got their picture, we put it on there, and we put their address on there and their name. And I'm speaking in this big place, and we had made enough of them. We stood them up right across that platform. They didn't like it. The CBMC didn't like it, but I'm the main speaker. <laughs> I'm laying my, my reputation on the line for those guys out there. And by the way, I never spoke for them again for almost 10 years after I did this. But then I preached on getting the world evangelized. It consists of going, giving, and praying. And I said, now here, there's a hundred. We didn't have a hundred up there. But these people are out there. Now they can't get the money out of England. They're literally starving to death. Now who will help me, help me and my wife? And you're walking to come to Chicago to our apartment and see how we live. And many men sitting there knew that kind of a job that I had. Well, I don't remember now whether five or ten, including the fire chief, walked down there and he picked that thing up. He said, Brother Harry, you don't need to worry about this. Others came and talked. But the CUVMC guy didn't even want to talk to me anymore. Never had another meeting like that. Which is what we should have been doing. Because when I spoke that morning, first I spoke in a Methodist church, a big one. Had air conditioning but didn't need it. <laughs> and there's maybe 500 people and, and this fellow took me to each place where I was going to preach three times a day you need to know where they're at and he said now brother Harry this next church you'll only have 700 people there this morning I said why he said well you we ordinarily have 1400 people but look it's really raining out today and you see, Brother Harry said, God doesn't need judgment day to separate the sheep from the goats. All he needs is a good stiff rain on Sunday morning. <laughs> Boy, was he right. 700, not 1,400. They might have messed up the hairdo. Coffeeville, Kansas. For some five or ten people. That afternoon, I spoke in that very place. A place was packed. Only 10 people cared about it. Only 10 people cared about it. I could hardly keep from bawling. That I'm ashamed of these brothers of mine that claim to be blood bought sons of Jesus Christ. I was ashamed of them. Ashamed of them. Now, they hadn't done what these fellows did. 
Listen to what they say. Then they said one to another, We do not well. This day is a day of good tidings. We hold our peace. And if we tarry till the morning light, some mischief will come upon us. And now therefore come, that we may go and tell the king's household. So they came and called unto the porter of the city, and they told him, saying, We came to the camp of the Syrians, and behold, there was no man there, neither voice of man, but horses tied, and asses tied, and tents as they were, and all this grain, everything there was. And he called the porters, and they told it to the king's house, and the king arose in the night and said unto his servants, I will now show you what the Syrians have done to us. They know that we be hungry, and therefore they are gone out of the camp to hide themselves in the field, saying, When they come out of the city, we shall catch them alive and get into the city. One of the servants answered and said, Let some take prey I thee, pray of thee, five of the horses that remain, five that remain, which are left in the city, behold, are as all multitude of Israel that are left in it. Behold, I say, they are even as all the multitude of Israelites that are consumed. And let us send and see. So they, they took, therefore, two chariot horses, and the king went after the host of Syria, saying, Go and see. And when they went after them unto Jordan, and lo, all the way it was full of garments and vessels. <laughs> These guys are running. They don't want to be <laughs> they don't want to be held down by trappings and by money. They're thinking about their life. And they are sure putting some real estate between them and the Israelites. And they went after them on the Jordan, lo, all the way it was full of garments, vessels, and the Syrians had cast away in their haste, and the messengers returned and told the king, and the people went out and spoiled the tents of the Syrians. So a measure of fine flour was sold for a shekel, and two measures of barley for a shekel, according to the word of the Lord, and the king appointed Lord on whose hand he leaned to have charge of the gate. And the people trod upon him in the gate, and he died as a man of God had said, who spake and when the king came down to him. Because he told him, in 24 hours, you're going to be able to buy all of this for so little money. And it came to pass that the man of God had spoken to the king, saying, two measures of barley for a shekel, and a measure of fine flour for a shekel shall be tomorrow. About this time, the gate of Samaria. And that Lord answered the man of God and said, Now behold, if the Lord should make windows in heaven, might such a thing be? And he said, Behold, thou shalt see it with thine hand, but thou shalt not eat thereof. So it fell out unto him, for the people trod upon him in the gate, and he died. I spoke at a missionary conference that had some very, very important missionary people in it. Two of them like this, I'm going to tell you about and I would tell them that this gospel's got to be preached in all the world for witness unto all nations, and then shall it come. And by the way, most great missionary leaders have had down through the years would agree with what I was saying there. I can show it to you in print. And they would laugh at me. They would laugh at me. The fact is, in Santa Fe, New Mexico, after I had done that on the morning of this big world missionary conference, and they had lunch there in the basement of this fine hotel, or this fine Baptist church, beautiful. And I go in, I sit down, and everybody's over there. And one of them would come over and sit down with me. The pastor of that church, who's a friend of mine to this day, and he'd been to see us this year in our house, who later left that fine, beautiful, big church and went to the jungles of Mexico, and he's got 30 churches going down there now. Left this fine, big church, but he said, Brother Carl, you should hear them talking over there about you now. All of them, man, they're saying, where'd this guy come from? Pay him off. Send him home. Boy, have you really rang their bell over there. And they're all mad. And he said, I just had to come on and get to know a guy could wake up a bunch of guys so dead as they are. Because everything you said about missionary methods and everything is taking place right here among the Indians. 
just the way you said it would, with a stupid way that we're doing it. That night I preached this group again. And before I started, I said, now tomorrow, Pastor Brown here, he'd like to know how many of you people here like to win souls. What a crowd. Six of them raised their hand. How do, these are all missionaries. I know why. Six. He said, all right, you meet me in the morning in the Lafenda Hotel, the biggest hotel, fine hotel. At 6 o'clock, we will leave. We'll go to the state penitentiary. And you'll get to preach there. Boy, we can preach to hundreds and hundreds of them. You know how many people met him the next morning at 6 o'clock and I preached three times on Saturday? You know how many met him? Guess, would you? You guess who it was. How did I know it was one? <laughs> they were not like these four lepers. If we die, we shall die. No, no. Friends, we better make up what we're going to die for because we're going to die. I don't know about you. I want to die for the gospel's sake and for Christ's sake and for the sinner's sake. It's got a right to hear the gospel and to glorify God. This is one of the greatest missionary stories in the whole Bible. You read this, these four pages here. It'll just show you how God's interested in getting this world of end. Because what this did, this saved the whole nation of Israel so our Lord Jesus could be born from them. They sure needed this miracle, didn't they? Now, in the last chapter of Daniel, you read it today, friend. He says, the Lord says, I'm going to scatter the power of my holy people to finish my work. Finish my work. Well, you better get interested. You better get informed about mission. So that you're doing what God wants done. So where he scatters you and where he puts you, you'll get the job done. Then we can go home. We can go home. I don't know about you. I don't want to live here another thousand years. I don't want to even live in, want to live in this house for another 20 years. Every time I shave, I get scared. <laughs> <laughs> Our Father, in Jesus' name, Please show us we, we do not well, we do not wise in holding our peace. While the church goes merrily on its way, not caring very much about the rest of this world here in the blessed gospel of deliverance and that we can know you and we can serve you and we can walk with you. Dear God, help us, I pray, that we might see this is the most important task and every man in this room ought to be just tickled to death and he can get to take a part in it and work for the king of kings and lord of lords. Little specks of sand like us, dear God. Have mercy and use us to bring honor and glory to your holy name, dear God, like you did that little 16-year-old boy when he ran toward Goliath that all the world might know there's a God in Israel. And I would ask you, God, that you'd bless this organization here, bless it with men that'll come in and help them, Help them with funds, help them with knowledge, and help them with love and concern and help any way they can, dear God, that this might be the greatest sending agency we've ever had in this North American continent. Because I know it's possible. You said, call unto me, and I will answer thee, and I'll show thee great and mighty things. And dear God, I'm calling unto you now, and I'm asking you to make this the greatest missionary sending and teaching station in the whole world so that we might finish this great job that you've given each one of us a part to do. I ask all of this in Jesus' name. Amen.